that we come to case 5 so this is a 3 month old male child uh came with complaints of feeding difficulty and lethargy for past 8 hours his respiratory rate is 76 per minute heart rate is 240 beats per minute bp is 80 by 60 mm of mercury he is having peripheral uh, feeble peripheral pulses with prolonged capillary refill time saturation is 96% at the room air you did a ecg because the heart rate is 240 and you get this kind of rhythm so it's a very standard ecg what is the interpretation so we have lots of answer and all of answers are say uh, svt supraventricular tachycardia why it is psvt and uh, not sinus tachycardia okay we agree it is svt but why not sinus tachycardia what are the points against uh, sinus tachycardia can you just uh, write in the chat box we waiting for your answers p waves please write complete answers narrow complex with no p waves absent p wave okay so p wave is absent that is correct no p waves okay that already Uh, anything else other than the p wave so that is one difference between psvt and sinus tachycardia then the qrs complex narrow and anything else no rr variation so it's a fixed rr interval very good i think that's another point in favor heart rate more than 220 per minute that is another right so uh why it is psvt and not svt right so i think the sir's video got frozen but we'll continue from here if you can uh listen to us so some of you have rightly pointed out uh so how you differentiate a svt from a sinus tachycardia which is the closest differential so in svt there is no p wave it is a supraventricular tachycardia the p waves are either absent or abnormal there is fixed rr interval and tachycardia usually of very high degree usually you get more than 220 beats per minute in the infants and more than 180 heart rate in the other older children and also you get a very abrupt history in the cases of supraventricular tachycardia uh, in sinus tachycardia usually it is caused by some cause right there will be fever there will be loss on loss signs of dehydration so some etiological clues will be there in case of sinus tachycardia while in psvt you will just get a normal child who was absolutely fine the day before and suddenly become fuzzy irritable and there is sudden onset tachycardia so this is this is how you differentiate an svt from a sinus tachycardia how will you manage this case please see this carefully see this carefully and then answer how will you manage this case just a one line answer is rather a one word answer is good enough how would you manage adenosine hypotension patient adenosine adenosine iv adenosine uh, i said read it carefully sakshi has said synchronize cardio version as the patient is unstable cardio version now the other answer is coming so when to use cardio version and when to use adenosine uh, we go back to dr vikram i so these are the two uh, options but which one to use when and what to use in this case uh, dr vikram right so svt has two lines of management you either have to do cardioversion or you give medications so cardioversion is done when the patient is clinically unstable unstable means the peripheral perfusion is getting affected so if there is prolonged crt bp is low peripheral pulses are feeble then you go for synchronized cardioversion so this patient this particular patient we will go for synchronized cardioversion 0.5 to 1 joule per kg that shock has to be delivered if the patient was stable you would have gone for adenosine that is the first line treatment for supraventricular tachycardia given at a dose of 0.1 mg per kg if there is no response you give it higher dose of 0.2 mg per kg so that is a treatment stable patient you give adenosine unstable patient you go for synchronized cardioversion okay um now going to the next question is uh, that again the same question i last what are the pitfalls or the common errors in the management of arrhythmias in children right so uh 
one of the major pitfalls one of the major thing is that not identifying arrhythmia in the first place right we do not suspect we do not sometimes do continuous ecg monitoring uh, every critically sick patient has a ecg electrode attached and we should do continuous ecg monitoring any patient with where you are suspecting dyselectrolytemia they should have continuous ecg monitoring so we sometimes don't diagnose arrhythmias that is the worst for, one of the most common uh, pitfall in the management of arrhythmia we do not diagnose them frequently enough. they are not that rare if you do continuous ecg monitoring you will see that there are those tall t waves and there are those uh, arrhythmia patterns in the ecg and again not obtaining a 12 read ecg you should not rely on the monitor ecg right uh, so if you suspect arrhythmia you should get a complete 12 read ecg and evaluate all the uh, leads because sometimes if there are ischemic changes they may be particularly there in one kind of leads and not uh, in the other kind of leads arrhythmia you can uh, get a lead 2 which will show you the rhythm pattern and you can analyze the rhythm on lead 2 but ischemic changes may not be there in all the electrodes and they may be uh, localized to one or two particular kind of electrodes then not treating the un- uh, underlying cause it's not that you have to give anti arrhythmic agents right at the onset when the, when you found some arrhythmia you have to look for correctable causes so you have to remember those uh, h and t which are taught in pals like hypoxia hypoglycemia hypothermia h plus iron uh, that is acidosis similarly for t you have the trauma toxins tamponade and tension pneumothorax thromboembolism so all these correctable causes which are easily correctable hypoglycemia hypothermia these are not difficult to treat if you take care of these causes most of the arrhythmias will resolve hypokalemia hyperkalemia if you if you manage that hypokalemia you give patient potassium ecg will change uh, hyperkalemia you give calcium gluconate to the patient you can visually see that ecg uh, arrhythmia is changing into the sinus rhythm right there on the monitor so and one of the common pitfall again is i think the reluctance to use defibrillator they are available they are available uh, most of the places uh, even uh, i think defibrillators are available in the malls and the bigger complexes as well but somehow residents have some reluctance to use defibrillators and wherever there is an indication to use defibrillator one should go for it like in this case the patient is showing signs of poor peripheral perfusion then you have to do synchronized cardioversion don't wait for putting cannula trying for adenosine you just have to give, give synchronized cardioversion and the patient will improve well dr vikram of uh, the few questions from uh, audience and one or two question from my side Uh, any specific criteria to define hemodynamic instability i think dr vikram has already clarified this the pulses and the crt are important criteria for maintaining whether it's stable or not uh, the next question is difference between synchronous cardioversion and defibrillation and another answer is also given that defibrillation is not uh, i think i lost that answer uh, so can you answer that difference between synchronous cardioversion and defibrillation that's yes, very good question very uh, common queries among pg students so these two are different things same machine you are using only the voltage is different and the different is synchronized cardioversion so synchronized cardioversion means it is synchronizing with the ecg so it detects the r wave right it detects the r wave and with the r wave it synchronizes the shock to that r wave and delivers the current uh, synchronized with that r wave Right, so that is synchronized cardioversion. You use lower joules in synchronized cardioversion, like 0.5 to 1 joule per kg. Defibrillator is different. Defibrillation, when you give, you deliver higher shock. Like it, it is like stunning the heart at the moment. When the rhythm is just, it is like ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia. There is no R wave. You cannot synchronize. So you just give a higher amount of shock to the heart, and expecting that when the heart retains its normal rhythm, that that new rhythm will be a, a new new sinus rhythm. so it's like giving a jolt to the heart a higher amount of shock it suddenly stuns the heart in the defibrillation and assumes that now the new rhythm will start and it will it will be a new sinus rhythm while in synchronized cardioversion it syncs itself with the patient's rhythm deliver a lower amount of joule and lead to correction of arrhythmia so that so is defibrillation the- is not synchronized with r wave yet yes. the answer that shitama also gave uh, there's a query from krishna priya or rather a statement uh do you agree with this pals tachyarrhythmia algorithm asks to give adenosine first 
even in the unstable narrow complex if iv line is present yes so you have you you itself have given the answer if iv line is in c2 if you have a good iv line in c2 that that is that is a that is a thing to be taken with precaution so if the there is you can try if there is a patent iv line placed very close to heart is already there then while you are preparing a defibrillator you can always try adenosine yes that is recommended and that that can be tried even in a stable patient if you already have but don't waste time in putting iv line if it is not there it is, if it is there you can try adenosine also my next question to students just uh, tips uh, how do you give or what are the precautions you take when you give adenosine what are the can you uh, you cannot demonstrate obviously uh, had you been there physically we would have asked you but what are the precautions when you are giving adenosine practical tips lift up hands rapid flush two technique three way cannula required fast plus flush flush with saline flush adenosine followed by 10 ml normal saline flush why raise the hands any any access close to heart to vital vein okay i think we have all the answers coming up dr vikram yes so adenosine has a very 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 short half life it has a half life of 2 to 5 seconds 2 to 6 seconds so it has to reach heart very early so first thing it has to be followed by a saline flush usually we give it by three way because because there is no time because you give a uh, adenosine change the syringe and give the flush you use a three way technique so simultaneously you attach from one end you attach your adenosine at the other end of the three way you attach your saline flush and while you push your adenosine you simultaneously push your flush so as to make the medicine reach the heart as soon as possible and secondly at this point most of the students know the other point that cannula should be placed as close to the heart sometimes you put the cannula in a, a peripheral vein like in the legs it around the ankle that is not a good enough sign see to try a vein which is very close to the heart okay thank you dr vikram